Well, thank you, Gail, for coming and sharing with us. Woo! Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm Gail, and I run a charity. I'm a mother. Thank you. Um, I've been doing work for Tax Justice Network, for Occupy, Stroud, and Occupy Democracy, Street School Economics, and I support Transition Stroud. It's a lot of stuff to do, isn't it? Us activists are, are quite busy. I'm, I'm also a compassionate revolutionary. And what I want to talk about today is how we can support local actions for Occupy Rupert Murdoch and Occupy the Media Billionaires. So people can do things locally and I want to say what they can do and why I think that's really important and also talk about a wider context here. A, a project that I'm supporting called the Compassionate Revolution. It's a project on its way. It's a project whose time has come. With support of um, my colleague uh, George Barder and Ben Kidd, we've been pulling together um, the Occupied Sun. Thank you ever so much uh, for getting this together. Um, it's online. It's available from occupythemedia.org.uk, you can download it and you can print it off. Now, if you go into your local news agent, and like me, you feel really angry sometimes at the headlines you see, attacking a mother, attacking somebody who's on benefits, attacking disabled people, you don't have to put up with that. Let's be clear and realistic here. What's happened since austerity is there's been a dialogue between the politicians who want to push for austerity and this kind of media outlet, and they've been leaking and pushing an agenda that's an agenda of hatred. And as a result, aggression against disabled people has gone up massively. Disabled people have been attacked on the street as a result of that. So some of the most vulnerable people in society are the scapegoats. Well, you just don't have to sit there and put up with that. When you walk past those headlines, I've taken legal advice. There's absolutely nothing illegal about moving that newspaper, that pile of newspapers somewhere else within the news agent. You might not want to, you might want to be careful when you do it so that the uh, news agent isn't watching uh, just at that moment. It makes you feel quite amused. Uh, you might want to put flyers inside uh, some of the papers, um, but feel free to, to move them around. And look, imagine if a million of us across the UK did that and we inserted things like the Occupied Sun or the Daily Whale has been produced last week. We'll start to send out a message and it's by acting as a collective that we can really make a difference locally. If you're not feeling quite so brave, um, you can stand outside your local WH Smiths or supermarket or whatever and you can share this information about the fact that five billionaires own 80% of the media. Let people know what they're reading. You can look at specific issues as well. We've got some Occupied Sons that focus on fracking. And uh, there's a Facebook page for the Occupied Sun so that you can get uh, previous uh, versions of it. So feel free, help yourself. It's what I call a collective act of art. Yeah. Um, it's also really important to boycott these uh, news agencies. Um, there's um, been a, a Boycott the Sun campaign for many years, I think led by our friends up in Merseyside. Uh, please do support their campaign. And also, it's really great if you can uh, share alternative sources of media. So, realmedia.press, the one to watch out for. They're going to be channeling together many different alternative sources of media. I think that many of us have got so despairing of information that we just don't bother watching the news. Um, it's a bit like not bothering voting. I think there's a, a in some places a logic to it, but in other places, um, in, in other places there's um, a place where we do need to stay informed. So um, we do need to share information. So that's where social media is great for us. So basically, I'm really encouraging you to take actions locally, to work together with small groups, 38 degrees groups, union groups, whatever and to take some action, whether you're doing it as anti-fracking people for activists or environmentalists or um, people thinking about single parents, whatever. You've all got a reason to be um, thinking about um, the media. Okay. Um, so, why I think it's important to take local action. Um, I was born in 1972 and um, I think it's got something like 10 years later 
the miners' strike happened. My dad was a coal miner. Um, and growing up in a sort of working class coal mining community, the women's movement wasn't that strong in my household, but it was around. Somehow it permeated and the message of the women's movement came to me. Um, I can say it was a very traditional uh, household in my family. When my dad was on strike, he put his feet up for a year. He, uh, to be truthful, he never went on the picket line. Um, they had a good relax and my mum carried on doing the housework. So it wasn't in some ways a great model, but um, you know, I'm not to put down the women in my family, there's some, there's some great women in my family, but the women's movement, the message of the women's movement got through. And I think it's important to say, like, why did it get through? It got through not because of one march or one action or one documentary, it was all of that stuff together. It was that collective. And I think it's just really important when you're part of a movement to remember when you stood like we are out in the rain, that, that those actions that those women and the men who, who supported as allies took they really brought home the women's movement to me somehow in the middle of Yorkshire, which felt like uh, the back of beyond. But I think the other thing we need to notice is that the system learns from movements. The right wing play dirty. We had a, a very inspiring speech from Anne Field this morning about the Wapping dispute and about the extremely dirty tactics that were taken by the right wing government uh, and Rupert Murdoch at the time. And, and basically, they're very good at learning from protest movements and we need to stay ahead of the game. And um, we need to remember that we protest to change things. It's not a form of catharsis. We're allowed to protest as long as we're not effective. And Nelson Mandela said that um, the oppressor defines the nature of the struggle. So some of the ways that they've learned to try and hold us back is that they just simply don't cover the stories. It doesn't matter how big the march is, it's not covered. Or the, or the numbers are, are underreported, um, or maybe it's just covered in the local news. A, a friend of mine, Jane Rose, a very inspiring woman, um, recently, uh, sort of a couple of years ago, went to um, uh, an anti-nuclear weapons protest, and she scaled the fence into the into the establishment. And she said, in doing that, she stepped over a fence in her mind and realised that actually you have to you have to put your life on the line. You have to step over and and enter into the world of civil disobedience. And so what she did, decided to do after that is another collective act of art, and she organised Wool Against Weapons, where people across the world knitted um, part of a peace scarf. It was seven miles long, this peace scarf. It's currently being made into blankets. And it was calculated that about 25 years of knitting went into this thing. Now, that might not be everybody's cup of tea knitting, but some people, that's what they were moved to do. And to me, if 25 years of knitting goes into a protest and the protest is about billions to be spent on Trident and it doesn't hit the national news, that says a lot to me about our democracy. We've also had the gagging law, which is a law that's basically in action right now, preventing NGOs from speaking out online about certain uh, politicians who are standing. They're not allowed to point out their policies. What on earth? What does that mean for our democracy, the gagging law? I think it was especially set up because people like 38 Degrees were getting quite effective. They're much bigger than any political power uh, party in the country. They've looked, looked, learned how to manage marches. I don't know, probably lots of people here have been kettled at some point. The idea is, come over, you're allowed to march, but you know, F off as soon as possible, so we can ignore you. We can give you the appearance of a democracy, we can, we can honour, apparently, the right to protest, but we don't want you to be effective. We don't want you to stick around. So the other thing that's happened is that people that do stick around, which is occupations, they pass laws to prevent occupations. So basically, uh, much of the land in, in, in London now has specific laws that says you can't stay there, you can't occupy, um, you can't have any sleeping equipment. We've been occupying Parliament Square, Russell Brand brought us some pizzas, thanks Russell, and um, somebody sat on it and apparently it's a sleeping structure, a pizza box. They're using the law like that. The policing that's going off at the minute, it's incredible. Who's policing the traffic? Who's policing the joyriders that are stretching through the, through the streets, you know, almost killing people? They just ignore that, there's no, there's no uh, money for that. We've had an FOI, a quarter of a million pounds has been spent suppressing the occupation just in one month in Parliament Square. 
there were specific, this is not new, yeah, there were specific laws passed against the suffragettes. When they used to gather in Parliament Square, they used to gather under the statue of Boadicea, um, and then they used to march collectively and petition for the vote. And so a law was passed, no more than 12 women could gather in Parliament Square and go to, and go to the government. And then they hunger struck, and it was incredible what these women went through. They were tied to chairs, and pipes were forcibly uh, thrust down their throats. Many of them got injured, and they were, and they were force fed. And then the Cat and Mouse Act was passed, and basically the women uh, were get, get, got to near death in the prisons, and they were allowed out to recover, but they had to come back and carry on with their, um, with, with, although they were political prisoners, they had to finish their sentence. It was specifically passed to keep suffragettes to near death. They use arrests of activists, they use what's called slapping, strategic litigation, applying pressure. It's all to drain energy and create fear. The union laws, the breaking of the union. Sorry, I'm not trying to depress us, but let's get real about what's been happening. Um, because I think it can get quite despairing when you think like, well, you know, why aren't there more people or um, why aren't more people up in arms? It's very difficult to fundraise if you're an NGO leading campaigns or doing really cutting edge research or, you know, investigative journalism. So we've got two things here, really. We've got the, the neoliberal goal of resignation. They want us to resign. Keep your head down. Just carry on with your work. You know, don't, don't, look, up, don't, don't look around. We're, we're in charge. Carry on. Um, and that's the feeling that, that can come through and that, you know, some of the reactions that we'll get today is it comes from that feeling. So, I think that resignation um, affects our ability to change things, but mostly it's about the fact that we've been disarmed. But we have to remember that civil disobedience was a key aspect of any change movement. And I personally believe we need to look online. So we've got this amazing thing of technology. We can share information and gain publicity through social media, and please do that. But do remember social media can turn into an echo chamber which is why you need to get on the streets and into your news agents and start swapping the occupied sun around. We need information to get into a public space. Uh, graffiti is illegal for a reason. Um, it's always played a role in social change movements. There's some great blogs online, look them up. So, and, and, and that needs to carry on. Now, I actually believe that the revolution is going to be largely self-organised because of the online space. And in that way, it'll be a good thing because it'll pave the way for a better world because it won't need as many leaders and it will be grassroots up. But you do need a seed. And by a seed, I don't necessarily mean the ones that grow trees, I mean the ones that grow crystals. You, know, you need a little starting point. There needs to be an online space in which people can pledge acts of art, heart and civil disobedience. And it's going to be called the CompassionateRevolution.net. Um, Basically, uh, with the Compassionate Revolution, I think what, we, what we're going to try and tack, uh, tap into is what some people call clicktivism or slacktivism. It's the idea that you can do something quite quickly online. Well, I think that's okay as long as what we're doing online is, is an edgy thing. And it, I'm not saying don't sign the positions, do, but there's an, a point where they're just holding off madness and, and the madness carries on. And it can be a point of entry to further action. So some of the actions can start off quite small, but we, they can get bigger. So basically, the Compassionate Revolution says that we need a rapid redistribution of wealth and power to tackle the urgent issues of our age. If you agree with that statement, you can consider yourself a compassionate revolutionary, as long as you also believe in the sort of safer spaces thing, the non-violence thing, no racism, etc. And also part of what we're saying is that the systems and processes we have can be reorganised. It's not about smashing the system. You know, the people in this building can be unionised. Um, the people in this building could own their papers. They could, they're good journalists in here, you know. We don't, we don't need to smash anything. We just need it to be people-led. The unique selling point, if you want a bit of jargon from, the, uh, from capitalism, it, it is, is that the... The National Revolution will allow us to pledge acts of heart, art and civil disobedience. So in the way within events, you need to get lots of people together in the same place at the same time. Pledges can build over time, you know, so you might just start off with a few people and it grows and you can do press around that. So an act of art is like the Occupied Sun, it's like Will Against Weapons. An act of heart might be a mass meditation or a mass prayer or 
a mass mindfulness piece, and acts of civil disobedience. We've got many to, to draw on. Um, tax resistance, you know, when the social contract's broken, why do we pay taxes? We don't have to withhold all our taxes. You know, I work for Tax Justice Network, I believe in taxation, but when the social contract's broken and things like TTIP um, and fracking get brought in, which were never voted for, I think it's perfectly reasonable for people to withhold a small amount of tax in solidarity and to say it's time things have to change. Now, that is, to an extent, you can do that on conscience, like the peace tax movement, but you can withhold tax if other people do it. And that's what the suffragettes did as well, actually. Some of them said no taxation without representation. Some just went ahead and withheld tax. But others waited until, say, 50 others were doing it. And that's before we had Twitter. Um, so basically, one of the things that we know that needs to happen is a sense of alignment. We're not waiting for a movement. There is already movements. There are many, many movements. And people have been working for years. They've been working on themselves. They've been working on their communities. They've been working on different ways of doing things. They've been hash resisting harm, or hash healing harm, or hash working out way better ways, you know, permaculture, or hash collective evolution. I love the fact that a guy took it upon himself to analyse today's Sun newspaper, or recent Sun newspaper, and put together all the images of women and all the images of men. I don't know if we've got it around somewhere. Um, and, and that's because of the women's movement and the men's allies movement that come together that to just that happen comfortably and I, um, thank you brother for doing that it was a, a lovely thing to do so so people have been um have been doing these actions and I, I think that we should all feel that we can carry on taking the actions that we're doing the, the things that we're passionate about but what i call on us to do now as a movement is to lend a small percentage of our energy to the collective. The very simple thing you can do is identify as a compassionate revolutionary. Start using that hashtag and start saying what else you're doing for the revolution, whether it's healing harm or resisting harm or building up better ways, etc. But also you can pledge. You know, they're talking about in Europe bringing in laws that mean that we can't swap and save seeds anymore. Well, why don't we all pledge that we're going to break that law if we bring it in? Um, I have a number of barristers that are helping with this movement, um, so I could, we'll be able to advise you on the risk that people are taking. But there's no risk in pledging, as far as you understand it. So the website will be an information space, and other people can initiate pledges. So get thinking, get creative. There are other parts of civil disobedience, you know, occupations, strike actions. Um, yeah, there, there are just lots of other ways in which people have done civil disobedience actions, we can, we, can, we can do them as we come. Debt refusals, I think it's really important we take on big finance. We could take out loans and refuse to pay them back. We can send money to uh, climate change projects, but we can do it when there's millions of us. That's when it's going to be effective. Let's use the power of online. So I'm really calling on you all to be compassionate revolutionaries, to use the hashtags, and if you really want to help, uh, join our Facebook Facebook group and be a compassionate revolutionary maven and bringing it back to Occupy Rupert Murdoch. Get out there, download these uh, occupied sons and start spreading them around. Thank you very much. Yay. Woo!